technicians of Spaceship Earth, this is Hawkbinge. Yes, it's Hawk Binge, your journey through the astral plane that is the Hawkwind discography, one album at a time, in the company of a long-term fan, which would be me, and as you know, our first-time listener to all these albums is Matt, who is in New York. How are you doing, Matt? I'm doing fine, thank you, Andy. Happy Easter. And to you, you're having a particularly cosmic one, given the background I'm looking at on this Google Meet yeah, I've tried to give myself a nice background because I'm currently hidden under a duvet uh, that I've made using a <laughs> kind of strange mix of, of packing parcels and um, turntable flight cases to try and remove the echo, which is happening every time I pack something up. I'm just making my place more echoey and I can't wait to move and solve this problem. So you are reviewing Space Ritual from your cosmic tent. That is exactly what I'm doing. Which I think is about as, as Hawkwind as it gets. All I need is some kind of lava lamp, and I would have an excellent vibe, I think, to fully appreciate this. It's a kind of free festival scene going on. I like it. Very good. Very good. So we are doing this episode as a bonus episode, uh, because as everyone will know, our mission here on Hawkbinge is to go through the discography of the studio albums and kind of trace the new music and the development for Matt to hear those, rather than listening to the live albums and just hearing them play what he's already heard live. But as we all know, Space Ritual is a bit of a different kettle of fish. You certainly cannot skip it over. It's a bit of a monument for Hawkwind. And there's a bit of a spoiler in that as well. Uh, Matt doesn't know anything about the studio albums as we get to them. He doesn't know which ones are well-regarded, huge albums, ones that are more divisive or things that people don't like quite so much. But the very fact that we are doing a bonus episode to cover Space Ritual is a bit of a clue for Matt that it's a big one because we're not planning to do any of the other live albums, although we may come back to them in future. So uh, we're not, in this case, going to be choosing tracks for the Sessions playlist or looking at our turntable picks that we've been listening to or those kind of things. We're really going to get into the music and the cover and the tour as a whole and what it kind of means on the Hawkwind journey. But before we do that, on the postbag situation, we've had a, a few emails and a few tweets where people have really gone into their history of listening to Hawkwind. And really, because they're listening along with Matt coming to this for the first time, and it seems to be causing a few people to not necessarily reappraise, but re-listen to things in a different light. Uh, and that's brilliant. And two emails in particular, one from Nick Randalls. Hi, Nick, if you're out there. And one from Bramwell Johnson. Hi, Bramwell, if you are out there. And Nick really talked at length about his Hawkwind affiliation since he was the age of 10 and listening to Space Ritual at the age of 14, which is something I can't quite get my head around what that would be like. Um, and his background in sci-fi and comics and these kinds of things, ending actually with the fact that uh, his version of 7 by 7 as was the case with me was the live version of it which we'll be talking about on this pod rather than single version and that was the one that he really feels is canon Bramwell talked about Hawkwind uh, really as a jam band as coming out of that kind of ethos of late 60s psychedelia some of their music being proto-punk and rave kraut rock he called them the UK's answer to the Grateful Dead in in some ways which I can totally see but the great thing for us, I think, is just seeing how the podcast is making people think about their own journey with Hawkwind and come to coming along on this journey with us and listening to these albums in a new light along with Matt. I know I've totally found that a lot of my preconceptions about what it would be like for me have been blown out in re-listening to these things in a deeper manner and piecing that story together in a linear fashion is a really interesting one. It's brilliant for us that some of you are coming along with us on that journey. Um, had some people who've joined in after the last episode, but have listened to the whole thing in one massive hit, which is a hawk binge by any definition, a hawk binge binge. So uh, hello to uh, Alistair McLeod and Corinth Ian on Twitter and uh, Elric Newby of the book fame, our reference to what the rest of the fans think with his book of the top 40 albums from the Hawkwind fans worldwide Facebook group who's actually been listening to us on our YouTube channel. So welcome aboard, everybody who's new. If you've managed to get through them all in one go, that is quite remarkable. Quite a lot of love, actually, off the back of the last episode for the Geobia and Blackwater Holy Light tracks from our turntable picks. And it's interesting on the Geobia front, because I looked them up on Bandcamp literally last night, 
and found that they covered Silver Machine, which I didn't pick up from all of the cover versions that we went through and that were posted that were kind of bouncing around. Yeah, one of my favorite bands covered it and I never even knew. So uh, look that one up, anybody who out there who liked the Geobia because it's a bit of a cracking cover for sure. And Matt, you have a bit of an update for us on The Black Heart. Was it saved? Yes, Andy, they smashed their target with five days remaining before it finished, which is fantastic. Their official response on their site has been that uh, solely by the kindness of the Friends of the Black Heart, we have hit the 150,000 mark with our crowdfunder, which puts us in the best position possible to be able to open our doors again this May. Their website has a whole bunch of cool stuff which you can go and check out, including future lineups, what they plan on doing. But it's really nice to know that in an atmosphere which has obviously been so depressing for live music, that there is a a little oasis of hope, at least in this good story, that people have been able to keep one of the most significant venues in London, as far as we're concerned, alive. So that is a great result. And it's really nice to be able to say that. That is excellent news. I must admit, I kind of had my doubts when I looked at what they had to do and how much time they had left, but that's brilliant news. So, good news all round. And as we get into Space Ritual, being a live album, something we talked about on our introduction to ourselves in our very kind of first episode, episode zero, and we talked about our differing musical backgrounds, the fact that I'd very much come from a band background, you know, whatever genre it was, it was always musicians on stage. You'd come from a more electronic background. The live album is something of a staple of rock bands, for sure. I mean, I grew up with Queen and The Who and Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath and all kind of all had these legendary live albums at some point. What's uh, what's your background with live albums? My background with live albums is a little bit more mixed, as you uh, as you say. There's an interesting mix for me where I have a few live albums. In fact, I went through my record collection to see how many I have, and I have a few from electronic producers. I have the Moderat live album, which is um, Mode Selector and Apparat, two different German producers coming together to create a live dance music experience. I've got the Billie Eilish live at Third Man Records, just because I think that that album that she produced where we all fall asleep, where do we go was really interesting. And I wanted to know what she sounded like live doing something acoustically, which is very cool. I have three of Stephen O'Malley's records, which is just him doing his almost solo sun impressions, dread, end ground and fundamentalist pigs uh, and a couple of strange like Japanese jazz records. But I think they're, it's like 0.1% of my whole record collection that I have. That being said, I have a few live DVDs. I'm going to bring up the Gorillas again. They did the Demon Days DVD, which was one of their amazing shows, which we actually saw at the O2 a very long time ago. But they produced a DVD of that, which is uh, very cool with all the visuals and everything. And I grew up listening to Genesis Live on CD in the car of my parents for a long time. So I'm pretty sure I have that memorized, that CD. <laughs> That's the first one, isn't it? With Peter Gabriel doing like Return of the Giant Hogweed and all that kind of stuff. No, it's not. No, this is a um, this is the other guy. <laughs> Phil Collins. We had that on CD and then they had a DVD of it later. And I do remember when we first got a DVD player in the family home, that DVD was one of the first ones that we watched because you could do that thing where you could use your remote to do different camera angles and this kind of stuff. And it was uh, like back then that was mind blowing technology. But also from my kind of music, listening to a lot of electronic music and a lot of dance music, the idea of the live mix, although it's not a live performance in the same way, going to clubs and seeing amazing DJs mix tracks together has still a very live element for me. You never know what's coming next. They're reading the room. They're making the crowd go in any way they please with the music that they make. You know, you have scratching, you have effects, you have really nice blending, you have people sometimes using four turntables at once. So there's there's a there's an interesting performative value in that, at least as far as I'm concerned. And I have a lot of artist mix CDs like Fabric, the London Club, 
produced or used to produce once a month a mix on CD, which I bought and I have every single one of those as a CD collection. I think those are the only CDs I own now is that entire mix CD collection and things like Boiler Room on YouTube where they've been able to make mixes where they focus very much on what the DJ is doing. So if you're interested in that, you can see the techniques as much as listen to the music. And there's also everything that we've gone and watched. And I do think that the kind of music that you talked about as live albums, I much prefer watching live. The idea of listening to a live album of that for me is is rarely as interesting as a studio album. It strikes me that you see less live rock albums these days than you used to. Anybody can feel free to correct me on that. But I definitely grew up with there being a lot of very well regarded uh, live albums. But I don't see quite so many of them now. And I wonder if that's the, the YouTube effect. You know, so many kind of live clips on YouTube. It's, it's less of a thing now. Maybe people will correct me there and just point out a huge number of live albums being released every year. I'm just less aware of them than I used to be. One thing that I have found, especially on Bandcamp, is that a lot of bands bootleg their own live stuff. All right. Quite a lot of bands will sometimes have someone in the crowd with a tape recorder or some kind of recording device, and then they'll throw up that on Bandcamp for like a couple of dollars or pounds. So if you weren't there or you were there and you wanted some kind of memento of it, then people are kind of, yeah, they're self-bootlegging, which is interesting. So it's it's live insofar as it was captured at the time. It's not live in the same way that like a full live album is recorded. So it, it, it's different, but I do feel like that's something that has come up in a kind of internet bootleg way. Yeah, that sounds good. I'll have to go in and check some of that out. Uh, there's a lot of bands that I like on Bandcamp, so we'll give that a look. For now, we are talking about Hawkwind. We are talking about them being live. Let's dive in to the Space Ritual. Okay, it is 1973, and Space Ritual is released. It was recorded in 1972 at the Liverpool Stadium and Brixton Sundown, I think mainly Liverpool. The lineup for Space Ritual is Dave Brock, Nick Turner, Lemmy, Dick Mick, Del Detmar, Simon King, and Robert Calvert. Now, we know Robert Calvert has been around the band. He wrote Silver Machine, sang Urban Gorilla, and generally been uh, in and around the band. But he wasn't actually featured on the Do Re Mi album at all. He's on some of the bonus tracks if you're listening to the re-releases and extended versions, but we don't really cover those. So he's come back in to be on stage, and he is responsible for poetry and swazzle, according to the sleeve notes. Does a lot of the spoken word stuff that kind of glues the album together. And some of that's in, got an interesting past. So The Awakening is actually taken from prose that he wrote in the logbook that accompanied In Search of Space. And The Black Corridor is adapted from a Michael Moorcock book of the same name. And Michael Moorcock is a name that who will be associated with Hawkwind for a long time. And we will get to more of Michael Moorcock later. Now, this album reaches number nine on the charts. Not aware of them having anything that charts higher than this. So this is a high watermark for Hawkwind in the charts. It's pretty amazing, actually, that a live album can have that kind of effect in the charts. It's also an interesting case where, the, where there's a band where the live album is kind of the definitive statement from the band, if you like. There are only one or two others. Straighting Motorhead is one of them, where I think No Sleep to Hammersmith is probably the Motorhead album. And for a lot of people, I think that's probably the case. But even though other bands have huge, successful live albums, The Who Live at Leeds is one that springs to mind, or Deep Purple, Made in Japan, I think is a big one for them. You'd always pick a studio album of theirs. It's not the the big album is not the live album. Whereas for Hawkwind, it kind of is. So it's a really interesting one to dive into. Interestingly, they did the whole show again in 2014 as part of a benefit gig uh, for uh, Save the Badgers. I think there was some kind of a big cull being planned and people were up in arms around it. Seems like a very Hawkwind kind of a cause uh, that one save the badgers but there were other uh, celebs behind this in particular brian may and brian may recorded a song for save the badgers which has to be heard to be believed uh, we will post the link for that one it's quite remarkable i seem to remember it being played in the interval at the gig i could be wrong about that it might be my memory playing tricks on me but the other celeb behind this cause was brian blessed 
and Brian Blessed subsequently recorded a version of Sonic Attack with the band that was released as a single. Actually, it wasn't subsequently. They recorded it for the gig, because I remember now that Brian Blessed version of Sonic Attack was the version of Sonic Attack that they played in that gig that was at Shepherd's Bush Empire. Quite an interesting gig. Definitely not something I think of Hawkwind doing, is just kind of replaying old stuff. I generally like Hawkwind to be playing kind of new things and being, you know, showing off the creative side of their newer stuff. But that was an interesting gig. Uh, we will post those two videos, the Brian Blessed version of Sonic Attack and Brian May's Badger song on our Twitter feed and Instagram and wherever else we happen to be. And uh, Matt, I believe you heard the Brian Blessed version of Sonic Attack. So we will address this later. And actually later is now because it's time for Matt's hot take. So once again, I think Hawkwind has defied convention and my own expectations and any way that I ever feel that albums are made by doing something completely different with the concept of a live recording. I feel that when most other bands would do a live recording, they would play their hits or play the tracks from the previous albums for the crowd. And it would be like a, a special version for people who want to feel the energy of a live gig while listening to tracks that they know. But when I put this on, the first track that they open with is one that I'd never heard of before. The Born to Go track is not on any of the albums that we've talked about. So I was immediately perplexed, thinking that, OK, this isn't going to be Hawkwind going over their previous work just in a in a live setting it's going to be something i'm going to again have to actively listen to and kind of battle with in order to fully understand it i can't think of another band i've ever seen live that has opened with a track that people might never have heard of that's strange to me Interestingly enough, from like a an electronic point of view, if I went to see a DJ, I would expect them to not play music I'd heard before because that's part of the fun. They're actually, you know, bringing the freshest stuff out to the dance floor. So there's a reason for you to go and see them. You don't really want them to be playing tracks you've already heard. So after I listened to this through once and ended up feeling kind of perplexed, I went back with a little bit more of a... I'm listening to a DJ set frame of mind and I enjoyed it more because I was then more intrigued by the fact that new things were going to happen. It was going to be a, a performance that I would have to really listen to it and deal with and not just take everything that I knew and put it into this and just have a more relaxed appreciation. So it's it's for me, it was it was hard work, but I think it paid off for me eventually a bit more like the first album for me the first time i listened to it i was kind of annoyed by it just by the way it was choosing to behave again and i started to get into it more with repeat listens it's interesting just because again like every time we listen to an album they feel different so them picking tracks to put into a journey is interesting because it just then makes the whole explorative, experimental and slightly all over the place sound of Hawkwind interesting and justifiable somehow. I know I always talk about sound and again for this I do feel that the recording is kind of muddy again. I think it benefits from being played at higher volumes but I do still think that the whole thing is slightly hard to fully appreciate sonically because there's a lot of fuzz and I don't think that's just guitar distortion. I feel like that is just the sound not being captured as well as I'd like. The digital synthy effects and the spoken word is very clear. So again, it's one of those things where I feel like the sound is always slightly um, something that I have to, to wrestle with. And I was surprised not to hear the crowd so much. I do feel again like a live album normally starts with a big roar of the appreciative crowd as the band walk on. They don't seem to really have any of that. I thought that there would be a bit more crowd energy. Even with things like um, Time Left This World Today, I thought they'd have a bit of call and response from the crowd and you can't really hear that. I feel like you can only really hear them at the very end and maybe like halfway through, you can hear a little bit of applause and cheers and whistles, but there's not a lot of the crowd atmosphere, which I was surprised about. The spoken word pieces are, are fun. They feel very Alan Rickman in their delivery, which which amused me, and I guess that's just how they were how they were doing it. There was a strange, slightly over theatrical 
diction i thought in some of it with the seven by seven i feel like that's just how they do that so that's that's them i just always find it amusing whenever i hear it something else that amused me was the song organ accumulator i didn't know what that was so i wikipedia'd it and it's a real thing which was interesting but i just love that the fact the lyrics sound like a dad talking to his friends about a new grill he got you know just like it's just basically just like the the lyrics just list out the features like somehow we're on some kind of strange ethereal world shopping channel and they're just <laughs> saying it's all the all the stuff it does and, it's like, and i've got one it's like cool nice great thank you for showing off in song form but they're weird things the organ accumulator it feels very hawkwind as soon as i started reading it i was like yep yeah, okay this makes sense this feels very much like something that you'd see probably on a sleeve note or something that they'd have Again, lots of little surprises all the way all the way through it. I'm sure if you were there, it would have been very entertaining. I was surprised at the lack of Silver Machine because I wasn't sure whether or not this was recorded before they actually had that hit, but they had it, right? And they just decided not to, to do it. Absolutely. I don't know whether they actually played it live. I've got a feeling that they probably did play it live but didn't include it on the album. But either way, I quite like that fact. The impression I get and uh, probably other people who are more in tune with the specifics of the of the history here. But the impression I get is that they weren't altogether comfortable with having the hit single that has to be played every night for the rest of their lives. And they weren't kind of chained to it in the same way that, say, Black Sabbath were with Paranoid, where, you know, you'd get heckled and booed and stoned if you were if you didn't play the hit. And Hawkwind never really did that. Um, so I, I quite like the fact that they don't think it fits so they didn't put it on the album yeah i agree and i think again when you listen to this as a as a whole piece it would be massively incongruous but for me interestingly enough the track that i wasn't into in the last album the um time we left this world today oh that's not true i, I liked it but there's the bit where it goes really weird I feel like it works a lot better in this context because everything else has been kind of transformed and chopped and screwed around with in a way which makes it a whole performance. So then when you get to the point where it just goes that kind of what I called like clown car B section, I didn't mind it anywhere near as much because at that point I just didn't know what to expect. And that then seemed to fit with the whole vibe of the of the performance. Yeah, totally. I think there's I actually think a lot of the tracks are better live than they are on the album, which I think contributes to the fact that Space Ritual, you know, is held in such high regard. Um, how did you get on with those as opposed to the studio versions? I felt that the vocal performances were quite different in some of the tracks, like Lord of Light, for example, I thought the vocals were probably better in the in the live version, a bit less chaotic, however, when they hit the the long the long note, he doesn't change the tone. It's just longer and for somehow that really changed the whole piece for me at the beginning because the uh, the change of that note halfway through which changed the vibe of the track and just keeping it in the one note actually made it sound more paranoid like there wasn't so much of, of a resolve which was interesting i don't know if that was a conscious decision or that's just something that they did on the on the night but it was interesting the more raucousy things like Brainstorm and uh, Master of the Universe, I enjoyed the live versions of them. They felt a bit a bit more energetic and that the fuzz worked. I think Time We Left This World Today is better on this just because of, the, of everything else that's helped set it up for success in a different way, where for me in the album, it feels a little bit like it comes out of left field towards the end. This one made a little bit more sense i guess coming out of sonic attack as well like that's so weird that maybe if they'd have had sonic attack on the album then play time left this world today that would have made it better f for me but as a journey i like it and the 7x7 version i like the live version the delivery of the spoken word piece is a lot clearer like i could hear what was being said better i think it was delivered in a more interesting way so yeah i can see why the live version started to swap out the studio version on singles that you that you said you had yeah definitely and i think really all of this points to the fact that hawkwind really are a live band their natural environment at this point is live and they have to adjust to go into the studio and turn their live performances into tracks and i think that really shows seven by seven to me is actually one of my favorite tracks on the album um, I do love this stuff. So, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I think it, Born to Go really becomes a, a, a staple of the live set. 
really popular. They're still playing it now. Um, it's obviously it fades in and out of the set over a 50 year period, but it's been a strong place in the set list for uh, for a little while now in re- more recent years and uh, always a bit of a favorite with that kind of driving bass line you can just picture lemmy in the middle of all that does born to go end up on an album like the next album or is it just on this not that i'm aware of no i can't remember it ending up on any of the studio albums some of these things do some things kind of reappear but for the most part they don't so earth calling and born to go Welcome to Future, those kind of things. I'm not aware of them uh, reappearing. That is not the case with Sonic Attack, which, as you already know, gets re-recorded with Brian Blessed because uh, you heard that version. Before we come to Brian, what do you make of Sonic Attack? Because it's definitely uh, another real kind of milestone moment. It's a famous track for Hawkwind. I'm not sure I would call it a track, personally but maybe maybe it is it's again so different it feels like one of those little bits that you have in between tracks it's suitably weird for sure for me it feels very hawkwind it's got that feeling of ripped straight from the space logs you know that kind of thing that they that they do they've started to bring it out from just marginal notes in the cover and actually bring it out into something as an audio performance it feels a little bit like their vision of what it would be like if there was a one of those old nuclear strike PSAs, but for space or for like futuristic weaponry. That's an interesting one, actually, because I was wondering if you would get the reference, if you like, because it is exactly kind of a parody of those government public service announcements. The famous ones in the US with duck and cover, which obviously is fantastic protection from a nuclear blast. And fantastic videos, by the way. If you seek them out, there are schoolboys with a voiceover going, uh, what are you going to do, Billy? That's right, duck and cover as an atom bomb goes off. Quite remarkable. And in the UK was Protect and Survive was the famous pamphlet that was sent out, the four-minute warning. Obviously, I grew up with all of that. I don't remember being particularly terrified of it. It was just what was going on in the background all the time. But you just missed out on that. By the time you were old enough to understand that kind of thing, it would pretty much have just just about have passed as the main threat. But it was a reference that you got. That kind of stuff was sampled almost within an inch of its life by DJs such as Cold Cuts back in the 90s as well. I think just because they were either such a strange piece of a bygone era that you almost couldn't believe it was real or it was talking about history repeating itself in terms of things like Afghanistan and Iraq worrying about nuclear proliferation and that kind of thing so there is that feeling of like it being said in a very Radio 4 kind of presenter voice talking about what to do if someone drops the scariest most advanced weapon ever created somewhere near you it's just one of those things where you feel like what are we as a species and just to listen to that is always very strange so to to take that and mess with it i know that you and i have talked about scar folk before which is that strange alternate world magazine about a small village in the uk which is like on a hell mouth or something and that you know you hear them do similar things like in in the uh in the case of demonic possession make sure to use your holy water then go and hide you know there's there's that kind of feeling of, of dealing with completely incomprehensible things that are much bigger than you in a way where you're being told to do something about it is always strange yes absolutely and we will post links to scarfolk because that is excellent for anyone to check out and this it gets even weirder they talk about a sonic attack then they talk about using wheels i'm not sure whether or not at that point we've grown wheels or whether or not we're using wheeled vehicles because at some point they talk about metal limbs over organic the same ideas of androidism of man machine interfaces all that kind of thing is still very alive with this you know the the idea of like children being in cocoons has an almost matrixian idea to it in in that kind of way so there's nothing normal about any of it but it is still relatable because it's going back to that very human truth of the fact that there is danger and some expert has come up with a way which has probably been politicised and changed and probably isn't actually very useful at all but has been at least made it feel like someone's telling you to do something but there's an underlying sinisterness to this with the whole like think only of yourself and don't help anyone else just get the hell out of there 
there's a, a feeling of, of hawk windy sinisterness which I know has crept in before with things like the children of the sun and um, the lyrics in things like time we left this world today about people watching you as you walk the street and all that kind of lyrical imagery there's a lot of that so this this almost just strips away the, the musical context for this and says nope we're just going to have a strange thought exercise about global space terrorism through the use of audio attack and that I think correct me if I'm wrong I think that is written by Michael Moorcock who um, it's worth looking up for future reference he will play a big role in Hawkwind moving forward and in the not too distant future as it happens now on Hawk Binge we do not jump the time streams uh, we don't give spoilers and Matt does not read ahead however for Brian Blessed I think we can make an exception because we're not talking about new new music in 2013 or 14 when this was done. It's a re-recording of this so I believe Matt you have listened to Brian Blessed being the narrator for Sonic Attack in 2014. Give us your slightly lukewarm take on that one. For me, this felt more, his his reading felt more like entertainment. And I don't know if that's just because Brian Blessed is seen as, you know, someone who goes over the top a lot. And this is already over the top. If you read this as just written words, I feel like you could think, oh, if Brian Blessed read this, this would be very dramatic. But I think the problem for me is that it being read by Brian Blessed actually makes it lose some of its power. It being read in a deadpan way that they have in the live version. It becomes more fun, but less sinister, right? It becomes creepier when it's read how it is in the 70s. The 2014 version I enjoy in a different way, but it somehow distances itself from the feeling of threat that I think about. And I think more about the idea of oh yeah imagine if that happened that'd be weird it feels more like we're looking at an archival piece more than this is something that could be happening now so it's different and it's interesting that the two deliveries do change the way that you appreciate it maybe it's also just because the first one in the live recording was obviously done nearer the time and so any rereading or remastering of it would then bring it up to the current time when i feel like now nuclear attack is not really a thing we think about anymore you know we're worried about different existential threats yeah, we've got enough of them haven't we it's enough to go around on the existential threat front for sure. So maybe then Brian Blessed reading it and it becoming a bit more of a piece of bombastic ridiculousness is fine because we're now not trying to reconvey that feeling. We're trying to look back at like that was a time when this happened and, and going even more extreme is just a way of parodying the way in which we as humans sometimes deal with these kind of things. Yeah, that makes sense. The different thing immediately is because they do the thing about um, if you're making love during Sonic Attack, bring both bodies to orgasm as quickly as possible it's said very deadpan by calva yeah uh but then like the brian blessed version you can just hear him say kind of like oh i get to say the word orgasm you know so <laughs> immediately you're just like ah, okay fine you know because you you wouldn't get that in in a yeah in a bbc star warning so you know i think totally. immediately by then you're like okay well this is where we are it's fine so hawkwin fans out there will already know that this is not the last time we're going to have this conversation because Sonic Attack does reappear. The very fact that there is an album called Sonic Attack is a bit of a clue. So at some point, we will have the ultimate deathmatch of all the different versions of Sonic Attack that Hawkwind have done, basically, and, uh, and uh, Matt will be judge, jury, and executioner. Uh, but for now, that is some years down the line. I think it would be interesting to talk a little bit about the kind of performance theatrics involved in this gig, because that really does separate it for me from what I came to know as kind of the standard like stadium live rock album, people coming out, you know, hello, Cleveland, and uh, how are you doing? And everybody goes, yeah, and you go, I can't hear you. And yeah, and this is the band. And here are all the band names and, and all this kind of stuff that you get used to. This feels to me like a, a, it's as, as much of performance art as it is a gig. And for me, that kind of led me into the same headspace, completely different music, obviously, but led me into the same kind of headspace when I was thinking about it in those terms as when we saw Sun in the terms of there's no audience interaction. It's something that you just watch, probably with your jaw hanging on the ground, which is definitely what we did when we saw Sun for the first time. There's nothing prepares you for that. 
And I kind of wonder if anything could have prepared you for this as a gig experience if you kind of came to it cold. That's a really interesting thing for me. Did you pick up any of those kind of vibes? I did. And the fact that there's readings in between these things and the way that the tracks flow into each other and, and it all feels very much like it has been put together as a performance which again, it flew a little bit in the face of what I would normally expect a live album to be, which is exactly what you've just said, where someone comes up and just, just plays the hits and then there's always a stop at the end of every track so everyone can give it up. It's interesting because the studio albums of Hawkwind feel like they're trying to do live in the studio and then their live album feels like they're trying to do performance art in their live. So they're always trying to do something that isn't quite fitting the medium like it's like it's a compulsion for them they can't just do anything normally but then when I started to understand what they were doing I started to like it more because it's not just one reading is it there's there's several and I think the thing that proves this rule is that when they come back for the encore and they talk about football it's <laughs> such a catapult out of the experience to me I almost like every time I listen to it I have to turn the volume down when they say that so I don't get thrown out and I didn't realize in a way how immersed I had got until they just mumble about Chelsea and suddenly I'm like wait what I didn't need a, a real life strange example of that then but actually them doing crowd work is really awkward and terrible and it's much better when they're talking about <laughs> Im- they're talking about imminent death through sonic explosions that's actually weirdly then much more normal to me that's a very good shout. That is a very good shout. This whole thing does feel to me, on listening to it now and, and doing this linear journey that we've done, which again kind of calls back to what we are talking about back in the post bag about this re-listening in, this, in order like this. Space Ritual feels to me like almost the culmination of Hawkwind's journey so far. I'm reminded of that sleeve note on the first album that talked about, you know, what we're going to do and it's going to be a blend of different media and different things and freak people out in a nice way, blah, blah, blah. This feels like that. Did you pick up anything like that? I think now you've said it, that does make sense. Everything with the inclusion of new tracks, with the um, with the inclusion of the spoken words, that this isn't a live album which takes the best of what they've done and just repackages it. This is still them going forwards. And that was interesting, just finding out whether or not any of the tracks that they have on here make it onto albums. Even these tracks, they're past, you know, even when they're doing them live, which really cements that idea as they're a jam band. And what I like about this is that if anything that they're cementing going forward is that they won't change and they haven't changed. They're still throwing new ideas in whenever they get a chance. They're still messing with tracks. They're still evolving this idea of what it means to be space warriors in a two-dimensional ship flying through space. You know, there's there's no point where they're like, well, we've done some albums and we're happy with this. Let's just maybe like rest on this for a second and then maybe in the future we'll come up with a strange edgy new sound. It's like impossible for them to do that. They have to be doing new things. It's almost like a compulsion for them. So there is something cool about that, that, yeah, that. Yeah, like everything you see, there's it's never a final documentation. It's just a milestone. And by the time you get there, they won't be there. They'll be off somewhere else. So yeah, it does, it does feel like it's not a live album in the same way that you can identify live albums. It's its, its own thing. It just happens to be live. Yeah, well put. The other thing we have to talk about in this is the amazing cover artwork by Barney Bubbles. So that's where we will go now. So Matt, this is quite a a staggering uh, piece of cover art. This feels to me like peak bubbles on this. The six sheet fold out with all these different panels. What did you make of that when I, because obviously had to send you the images for this because you would have been listening on Spotify, I imagine. And I, for the first time in many, many years, had to actually take the album out of its plastic protective cover that I keep it in and unfold the whole thing, which probably hadn't happened to it in 30 odd years. It did not fall apart, which was a good thing. Uh, But you had no warning that this was coming. I didn't. Um, This feels more like a return to the stuff that Bubbles did for In Search of Space. But even then, it's not quite that because In Search of Space was a bit more like angular and graphic. But it's nowhere near like Do Re Mi Fa Sol Latido, which is much more emblematic and even harsher. This is right back to 70s flower children kind of stuff. 
you know, you have this uh, naked goddess who is protected by two mutant screaming golden cats or something. There's a very odd vibe of the whole thing. But from what you said, when I was just looking at the front picture, I was thinking, yeah, this looks strange. However, I can completely see it with Hawkwind. When it folds out and you see that the layering of the kind of fiery, almost looks like a river of lava, which also makes the two-headed eagle in a very um, negative space, very subtle way, actually. I didn't see that for quite a while until I you know, really looked at it. But then the fact that the, the lines that make those eagles or hawks, why do I say eagles all the time? It's clearly <laughs> a hawk. That would make much more sense. I don't know. I don't know why we're doing this. This is an eagle wind. I'm an idiot. Anyway, the fact that those those lines trail off and then when you open the artwork, they trail off makes it very clear that it was always going to be this big kind of triptych. And even the fact that there's like blurry, blue, indistinct imagery on the front cover of the album that you don't really know what it is. It just looks like just a nice bit of texture. When you open it out, you realise that's the back line of the actual photograph. So you don't realise that. And I didn't realise that until until you open it up. And then you just get this um this cool illustration which is then backed by the band. And actually like four pictures, isn't it? Because the kind of lava flow separates the, the pictures. But again, there's that interesting collagic kind of idea. The fact that they have Hawkwind's the Do Re Mi logo in the left hand triptych makes me feel like maybe that's becoming an actual band logo beyond maybe an album logo. I guess I'll see whether or not that shows up again. But, um, but you know, there's there's lots of previously seen on Hawkwind kind of imagery here, but it also feels like it is doing its own thing. Yeah, totally. Um, it's just kind of off the charts. The imagery on the, the monochrome side is equally trippy and, and mystical in all kinds of ways. The font is becoming is coming through again, this kind of um, 80s computer font, which I, I associate more with like the 80s, but this is mid 70s. So it, it goes further back than, than I realised. But um, there's a lot of stuff which makes me feel like it's the Hawkwind logbook plus because this is the first time we've really seen colour for me, at least like uh, in a very graphic sense, the kind of strange, almost Genghis Khan head in the, the green and the and the red and something that looks very graphical. I don't really know what they are. It looks like flying commas, but then what almost looks like a kind of like eighties graffiti tag becoming a strange swirly thing. So there's there's lots of again visual experimentation all over the place here. Everything is mainly set in space still, which is cool. You have the like certain lyrics typed out. So you feel like you could you could listen to this and look at this at the same time and again you feel like Hawkwind have put a lot of effort into the experience of the whole thing, making it be an audiovisual thing. Because they say that, don't they, when they want to move past things, they say an audiovisual thing. Yes, absolutely. And you're absolutely right. So I think that them including the visuals in this is a very highly considered thing. That's a really good shout, actually, thinking of it as like the logbook aspect of In Search of Space being applied to space ritual. Some of those images, like uh, the image of the baby of the fetus there with, you know, the vernever, the universe resounds with the cr joyful cry, I am, etc., etc., going off into some quite mystical elements. It, it is definitely something you could listen to the album and immerse yourself in. Uh, yeah, I think that's a really good shout. So that is the cover. If you've got the album on CD or, um, or if you're, you know, if you're a streamer, it is very well worth seeking out good res high versions of these uh, they are quite something to behold not really something you see an awful lot of uh, in the future so that then takes us to the end of space ritual the album be interesting to know what everybody else thought of it so as always we refer to uh, to our bible in these situations hawkwind fans worldwide facebook top 40 albums by YouTube subscriber Elric Newby. And obviously, Matt, you know that this is, you know, one of the big albums for Hawkwind, otherwise we wouldn't be doing it. It comes in at number three in the list. That's a pretty good run, I say, for a live album. And it'd be interesting, I think, to see what you make of what comes next, because I think you reach this kind of point with the with the whole development, the old arc of the band, and you've got this. The question of what you do after this kind of hangs in the air, I would think. Yeah, 
I guess because it has tracks on it which we haven't heard before and is exploring new performative ideas, I do feel that it's still a band that can go anywhere. You know, I don't feel like it's just a album of what we've heard before, but live. Therefore, it's going to be a complete clean slate. I do feel like there is a feeling of forward motion, so I am interested to see where they go from here. I'm also just very surprised that it is as highly rated as it is. Again, maybe it's something that I'll appreciate more as we listen to more Hawkwind. But for me, I don't think it's an album that I'm going to be listening to again, despite what it does. And I've listened to it and I've appreciated it and I've like accepted it. And I think there's some bits that are cool. I just find the overall recording still kind of disappointing. And I would rather listen to the tracks I like on it in the studio because at least I feel like there's a fidelity there that I appreciate. Well, it'll definitely be interesting to see how you make of where Hawkwind go from here. It definitely sounds like... You know, you developed an appreciation for it and liked it, but you were very big on Do Re Mi. So it sounds like Do Re Mi is still your favourite album of the Hawkwind albums we've heard so far. Currently, I think, yeah, I think that's the that's going to be the one the one to beat for me, for sure. Cool. Well, let's see if Hall of the Mountain Grill can challenge Do Re Mi for the number one spot. In Matt's Hawkwind hit list, we will be recording that as soon as we can. We're both quite aware that we're not exactly the most regular droppers of content for the podcast. Uh, We both have rather chaotic professional lives, unfortunately, and being in massively different time zones doesn't make it the easiest to get together to record these. But we're looking to drop the Hall of the Mountain Grill show uh, as soon as we can uh, following this one. So until then, Matt, for people to send us messages about how wrong uh, we are, with Space Ritual or any of the massive factual errors that I may have made in the minimal research that I've done, where can they do that? So we can be found on Twitter and Instagram by searching at HawkBinge, that's our handle. We are also on YouTube. If you search for HawkBinge on YouTube, we are pretty much the only thing that comes up. And this episode may be worth checking out, even if you just listen to it now, um, scrubbing through because I will be putting all the artwork up on that feed so you can check it out in all its glorious detail and if you want to send us anything long form then we do still check our emails regularly which is podcast at hawkbinge.space we've really appreciated the people who have taken the time to send us longer form messages i know i've found it really interesting to see what people have been thinking about it and i know that andy really appreciates hearing people that are also coming on this journey and sharing quite personal feelings of what it's been like to grow up with Hawkwind. So uh, yeah, we, we appreciate check and read every single one of those. Yeah. It's brilliant. Just uh, knowing that people are coming with us on the ride and appraising things in the wake of Matt's overviews and how he kind of reacts to this music. So keep those coming. And until next time we will do what we were born to do and go. Great. Right. I'm taking this thing off. It's so warm.